Uh, good morning and welcome to our worship. Uh, a special welcome to, I know there are some who are here worshipping with us for the very first time. A very warm welcome. I see there are some who have returned. Shani, lovely to have you back from Wales uh, to celebrate your mum's birthday. So, happy birthday to you, Wyn. Um, any others that are visiting here today? Any that are new? Yes, up in the, up in the gallery there. Welcome, welcome. Uh, lovely to have you. Lovely to have you back visiting. Okay. Um, notice in our worship usual uh, restrictions about our worship today. There are seats over here uh, for social distancing. As you can see, we're sitting in every second, every second pew as is required. Temperature taken as you arrive, and uh, masks have to be worn throughout the service, which means we don't sing the hymns. We just uh, follow the follow the words. Although Ron is going to lead us in singing them as a as solo. Um, in our worship today, we are going to ordain to the eldership uh, Norma Latham, and so that will be part of our, part of our worship uh, this morning. Part of that normally includes extending the right hand of fellowship, which we're not allowed to do either. Um, we felt bumping elbows was not terribly appropriate, <laughs> so we're just going to warmly welcome her at that point in the service. And then you'll see next Sunday following uh, our worship is the first of our sort of mini Christmas fairs. Next Sunday is the Golden Elephant from 11 to 1. So please publicize that. Uh, and as you'll see in the, in the poster or in the emails you've received, what the various drop-off days are. But next Sunday, the Golden Elephant, 29th, Kids Toys and Christmas Crafts. And then on our December the 6th, Baked Goods, Plants and Accessories. That's all weather dependent, of, of, of course. I think these are all our, our notices for this morning. So let us worship God in following the words of the psalm, which is found at hymn 52. How lovely is thy dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, to me. who is the ground of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you lead the life of faith. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise and join with your whole church in heaven and on earth in proclaiming your goodness. 
We acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all. A God who in love creates and who in love sustains us. Who through your Holy Spirit seeks to guide us in the ways of life and of truth. That we might know life in all its fullness and abundance. And share that life with others. We gather surrounded by the very beauty of creation. The vastness of the ocean. The beauty of the night sky. We gather with a sense of your love which surrounds and which sustains. We gather too aware of our faults and failings. We have been called to live as your people. Fearless, faithful, obedient to your ways. And yet, too often we have slipped. We do not always live as we should. For we can be selfish and self-centered and insensitive to the needs of others, both those around us and those further off. And so before you now, as we ask for their patience and forgiveness, we, we ask for yours. Grant us the assurance of your forgiveness that we might leave behind these faults and failings and guilt of the past. Strengthen us, encourage us, Help us better to discern your presence in our lives, in our church, and in this, your world. Help us to go to the places we might rather not, but where you already are, the places of need, of suffering, the places of violence as you seek to bring peace and reconciliation. Help us all to be faithful members of your church, indeed faithful disciples, growing closer to you, and in so doing, growing closer to one another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We come near to the end of what is the, the church's year, next Sunday being the last Sunday of the church's year, and the following Sunday, believe it or not, the first Sunday in Advent. And it has been a strange year. But so we move towards the end of St. Matthew's Gospel. And the Gospel reading for today is the Parable of the Talents. It's St. Matthew chapter 25 and at verse 14. And Jesus taught this parable. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? 
then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. A difficult parable, and so now some music for reflection while you yourselves can reflect on it. It's a piece by a Spanish composer from Barcelona, which Oliver's going to play for us. I hope that was a sufficiently long piece for you to have worked out the meaning of this parable. <laughs> Actually, just some time back, we reflected on the parable of the, of the uh, pounds as it's found in uh, St. Luke's Gospel. And there's a clear overlap between the two Gospels and uh, we'll reflect partly on that. First of all, I was reading an interesting article um, in the UK News this week about Croydon District Council. Uh, Croydon, a, a, a district just south of south London, um, who had declared themselves bankrupt with debts of 1.5 billion. Right, 1.5 billion. And it seemed that what had happened in recent years was that with government cutbacks, they had decided to borrow money and invest it in real estate, which has gone remarkably and tragically wrong. And so as a result, the 1.5 billion in debt have declared themselves bankrupt um, and they're now being examined, surprise, surprise, for their, their conduct. I wonder if this parable has anything to, uh, to say to them um, about investment. They probably wish they'd taken their money and buried it in a hole in the ground. <laughs> it's not really about that. It's a, it's a parable that's it's used in different ways. It's sometimes used on a stewardship Sunday to encourage people's stewardship of the resources that they have been, they have been given and their generosity towards the church. It's sometimes used to just reflect on the gifts that we have been given and, and the different gifts and, and how we best use them or do not use them. Not just for the benefit of the church, but for the, the growth of, of, God's, of God's kingdom. But as I did when we reflected on the parable as it's recorded in, in St. Luke's Gospel, I think there is a, a somewhat different interpretation of it. And it, it rests, the whole story rests um, on a well-known piece of history which would have been known to, to Jesus' listeners and, and to the readers of the, of the gospel. First of all, consider the situation to which Matthew is writing, the congregation to which he is writing. And we're now talking about maybe 60 years after the, after the death of, of Christ and to a, a young and still vulnerable church uh, which is attracting the hostility um, 
of, of Judaism and, and, of, and of the synagogue. And one of the, the key understandings of the early church was around what was called the parousia, the second coming, the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. And they looked for it in, in Jesus' time, his inauguration of it. And at times it was said it was found in him, it was within their grasp, but at the same time it was something future. But for the early church, and we see this very, very clearly in the writings of St. Paul, for the early church it was expected soon. And here we are 60 years on, and in a sense little has changed other than this young fledgling church is enduring, enduring persecution. And, and so in a sense it's, it's addressing the, the issue of the absence, if you like, of the return of Christ and, and the failure in that time scale to see God's kingdom, God's kingdom established. Now, when we look at it, and I say there's a, a well-known sort of historical event behind this, which concerns Herod the Great. Before Herod aspired, well, when he aspired to power, he traveled to Rome. And he traveled to Rome to get Rome's authority for his kingship. And in that, he was successful. And so he was established as, as king of Judea. And after his death, Archelaus, one of his sons, did the same in dispute with another son, Antipas. So Archelaus traveled to Rome. He was, he was unsuccessful in being granted the kingship of all, of all Judea, largely because of his character and the, and the sort of person that he was. And it's interesting that in St. Paul's in St. Luke's version of the story, the king that travels, there are others that go as well trying to prevent the kingship being, being granted. So that's the, that's the story that in a sense lies behind that. And in both these stories, the person who goes away, whether it's the king to get his kingship established or whether it's the rich landowner who hands over some of his goods to his, his servants, um, in both cases, he's going to be away for some time. And thinking back to the story of Archelaus, they do not know what the outcome of that is going to be. So in a sense, they're asked to trade under the owner's name. So think about that for a bit. You're asked to take, you're given this, this wealth and you're asked to trade it, but you're asked to trade it in the name of your owner, the person who, who gave it to you. It's a bit like putting his sign up above your, up above your shop. Um, if you're in the UK, you'll find in some shops that they're there, you know, appointed by royal, you know, by royal appointment. If you go up to a D side for Balmoral Castle is, you'll find above the butchers and some of the other shops, you know, by royal appointment. Um, and you know, this is a, an encouragement to others to come in and shop there, I suppose. What this is about is, in the owner's absence, you trade under his name. Now, what do you do if you're not sure of what the outcome is going to be? Remember, there are those who went to stop Archelaus and those in the story, there are those who went to stop him getting that power and that authority. They were, they were against him. If you sort of pin your colors to that mast and it doesn't happen, then you're not in a good situation. So what do you do? And that's essentially what the story is about. It's about faithfulness. It's not so much about stewardship and, and increasing wealth. It's about faithfulness to the person who, who gave you this. Right. And you have that choice. You can either sign up and identify with them or you can stay quiet. That's essentially what the parable is about. Do you sign up or do you stay quiet? In times of well-being and no threat, then it's maybe easy to sign up. But what if you find yourself as part of a, a Christian minority in a country that's hostile to it? Do you display your faith or do you keep your head down? And that's the situation that the churches that Matthew was writing to. And all that's going against them with the persecution that's arising. Do you sign up or do you keep your head down? And so this essentially is a parable. It's about faithfulness. It's about loyalty. 
It's about continuing obedience. Um, it's, not, it's not a sort of blueprint uh, for trading and uh, increasing one's wealth. It's about faithfulness, about loyalty, and about obedience. And maybe just two little final comments about that. In Luke's telling of the story, which is quite interesting, it's 10 servants are each given a pound. And we're told that three of them return five, two, and one. But they're each given a pound. In Matthew's story, if you're listening to it carefully, they were given five, two, and one talents. Interestingly, they were given each according to their ability. So it seems harsh then to, to punish the one who uh, was given the one on the, with obviously the, the lesser ability. In Luke's telling of the story, the pound it is given would amount to wages for about 100 days. In Matthew's telling of the story, five talents would amount to a salary for between 75 and 100 years. Right? A large sum of money. So even the person who was getting one talent was being given money equivalent to 15 or, or 20 years wages. It's what we call hyperbole or exaggeration. It's, it's, a, it's an unreasonable, it's an unreasonable sum of money. And what it's meant to represent is the abundance of the gifts of God's kingdom, right? The abundance of God's gifts to us and the establishment of, of his kingdom. And that's why we have that phrase within it, enter then into the joy of my kingdom. Enter into the joy of this, to the, to the first two servants. And for the third, it represents an inability to do that. An inability to see and to recognize the gifts of God's kingdom. The abundant gifts that are given all, to all of us to be used for the establishment of God's kingdom. For the third, there's a sense of judgment upon him because of his inability to see, to use what he or she had been given. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The offering is received as we enter the church or as we leave, but we will offer now our prayer of thanksgiving, our prayer of intercession, and our prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your many gifts to us, for the blessings of life itself, for the opportunities that are available to us each day for the privilege of being called to serve within your church and to use the gifts given to us for the growth of your kingdom in service to others. We give thanks for the love that sustains us in our daily life, the love and support of family and friends, the fellowship and communion of your church. We give thanks for the very beauty of creation as it surrounds us here and pray for a greater stewardship of it, a care for its richness and beauty, and the turning away from exploitation and harm. And we give thanks all, we give thanks above all for the life and for the gift of Christ, for his sharing of our lives, the times of joy and celebration, but the times too of sorrow and suffering, and for his promise that he will be with us always, indeed to the end of the age. In his name now we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our families and our friends, wherever they may be this day, and ask your blessing upon them. We pray for those who celebrate, for those for whom this is a time of difficulty. We pray for those in good health, and we pray for those struggling with illness for those enjoying still strength and vitality and those who have become frail and dependent on the support of others, for those who laugh and for those who cry, for those enjoying the fellowship of others and the love of their dearest and for those who mourn their loss. Whatever our own situation, 
May we be thankful of your presence with us at all times and your constancy of your love. We pray too for those whose lives are so very different from our own, those caught up in the midst of war and violence which so scars the beauty of this your world. We pray for those in difficult economic situations here on our own island, those who are struggling through loss of employment, financial difficulties, homelessness. We pray that we may be a church that is caring and compassionate in our service to those in greatest need. And we pray for those who govern us and those who have the difficult decisions of managing resources, and of planning ways forward. May they be men and women of wisdom and understanding. May they be men and women of honesty and integrity. And so we pray for all the leaders of the nations and the tasks that are set before them. We pray that we too may all play our part in the building of a more just society. We offer our prayers too for your church, for the life of this congregation and for your church in the world. For congregations in good health, for congregations that are struggling and above all, for congregations and churches that are persecuted in the societies in which they live. And always we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship and a communion with them still through the mystery of the fellowship and communion that we have with you. Oh, gracious God, as we dedicate our offering and all our offerings of time, of talents, and of money, we pray that they may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the growth and the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now move to the ordination of, of Norma Latham. There are different gifts, but it's the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through different people in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. We have the joy of using our gifts as members of the Church of Christ, which is his body, continuing his ministry in the world today. Those who are chosen for the office of the eldership have the particular responsibility of caring for God's people and exercising oversight and leadership. Today, the Kirk session is met to ordain Norma Latham to the office of the eldership and to admit her as an elder in this congregation. Due notice has been given, no objection has been made, and we therefore proceed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, who being ascended on high has given gifts for the building up of the body of Christ, we are met to ordain to the office of the eldership and admit to that office in this congregation, Norma Latham. In this act, the Church of Scotland as part of the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, worshiping one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, affirms anew its belief in the gospel 
of the sovereign grace and love of God, wherein through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, incarnate, crucified, and risen, he freely offers to all, upon repentance and faith, the forgiveness of sins, renewal by the Holy Spirit, and eternal life, and calls them to labor in the fellowship of faith for the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the world. The Church of Scotland acknowledges the word of God contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the supreme rule of faith and life. The Church of Scotland holds as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith, recognizing liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine as do not enter into the substance of the faith, and claiming the right, in dependence on the promised guidance of the Holy Spirit, to formulate, interpret, or modify its subordinate standards, always in agreement with the word of God and the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith contained in the confession, of which agreement the church itself shall be sole judge. Norma, would you please come to the front? In view of this declaration, you are now required to answer this question. Do you believe the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith? Do you promise to seek the unity and peace of this church, to uphold its doctrine, worship, government, and discipline, and to take your part in the administration of its affairs? The Lord bless you and enable you faithfully to keep this promise. You're now required to sign the prescribed formula so, Doug, if you're able to, if you could bring this forward, please. Let us pray. Loving God, you have chosen for yourself a church in which your Holy Spirit inspires men and women to serve your purposes of love. We give you thanks that by your grace you have called Norma, whom we have named before you, to lead and care for your people as an elder in this church. We commend her to you now as we ordain and admit her to the office of the eldership within the church. Grant her the gift of your Holy Spirit, that her heart may be set on fire with love for you and for those committed to her care. Make her pure in heart, as those who have the mind of Christ. Give her vision to discern your purpose for the church and for the world you love. Keep her faithful to the end in all her service. Blessed be God for all his goodness, and blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, and blessed be his Holy Spirit, endowing the church with the fullness of grace. And to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory forever. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, I declare you to have been ordained to the office of eldership, and I admit you to the office as an elder in this congregation. As a sign of your welcome, we would normally extend the right hand of fellowship, but at our inability to do that, Norma, we just all warmly welcome to you to the eldership of this church. <laughs> it is an opportunity for the renewal of our own each your own commitment. Could you please stand? Christ calls us to share, all of us to share in his ministry. Let us then dedicate ourselves to his service. Members, elders, friends of this congregation, putting your whole trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, do you commit yourselves to love and to serve his church and kingdom? 
as members of this congregation, will you encourage and support your elders, surround them with your love, and remember them in your prayers. And to the elders of this congregation, in your service as elders, will you promise to carry out all your duties faithfully and cheerfully, God being your helper. Please all be seated. Let us pray. God of grace, you have called us to be servants of Christ Jesus and to share in his ministry of love to all people. Renew our zeal, give us joy in your service. Direct us by your spirit of wisdom and fill us with the gifts of your grace that together we may declare your deeds and show your love to the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn 679, a modern hymn, One is the body and one is the head. And for the closing benediction, after which we will say together the words of Go Now in Peace. Go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. Amen. Go now in peace, never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Know he will guide you in all you do. Go now in love and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see.
God will be there, watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith, and in love.